Shall we all come together to go through the rest of the service? I would like to call uh, Wick and Babs to come in front. As um, Silas had mentioned earlier, as you know that not only today we are celebrating the baptism, water baptism of Ethan, but also, you know, this is the month where we have been here in Stanmore for 10 years, you know. Amen. But this church has been for even much more, how many years? Uh, 43 years it's been going here in Winchester, in different places, but 10 years here. 10 years, Thank yeah, you. yeah. So great, uh, you know, that uh, we thought, why not celebrate the 10 years that we are here? in this place, and uh, kindly Michael and Karen has ordered a cake with 10 years anniversary, so which we'll be having later, so that's great. So can I, do you want to say yes, something sure. quickly? Yes, very quickly. Yeah. We were in an elder meeting in the city center, and we were praying, and you know the scripture where Paul said to, um, Paul said to the believers that they were going out in uh, Acts 16, let us go over to Macedonia because they need our help. And we were in the city centre and there was no community. Having moved from the back of the railway station at St Paul's, we did have a community. And although we were in the city centre for 20 years, people would come into the church and say, we're just visiting. We're, we're on holiday or something like this. And we prayed and we believe that God called us over here because that very moment we rang the people who own this building and they said, if you want to buy, it's yours. So that's what we did. We sold up in the town centre and we moved here. And I had the privilege of preaching on the first Sunday evening, which was the 5th of a 5th of May, and we sat like this. It was called a cafe-style evening service. And the scripture was 1 Peter chapter 2. And, and that was, you're a peculiar people, <laughs> a chosen people. And you've been chosen, if you know Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, to go out into the world. I actually wrote down a couple of things here of those last 10 years. Ali and Nay have gone to Basing, um, North Baddersley. Jordan and Ellie became youth leaders at Swanmore. Nina is just in week as the youth leader there. We've had anywhere up to 10 or 15 marriages and overseas in Africa right now, there's Jack. You get messages from him, I'm sure, in YWAM and Emma in Spain. Before that, Joy and Simon were in Romania. And God has taken people from here and started works over the Isle of Wight and in Salisbury as well. And we've been a church that's gone out into the world. And after the lockdown, there were about 40 of us here. And the rest of you have joined us since then in the last two years. And I just give thanks to God for each one of you, because you're here for a purpose. God loves you, but in this community where we can reach out to the people here and God will bless you. Right now, at this very moment, 47,000 people are dedicated to running the London Marathon. But the Bible tells us we're all in a race and we look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy... He went to the cross for you and me. And if we know him as our saviour, our main concern is to share Christ with others, wherever we meet, especially in this community. May God bless each one of you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Vic. And I'll call Babs to pray for us. Thank you. I've got some scriptures. It's quite good to be able to look back, but it's even better to look forward to what God's going to do. Uh, Sanjay put on our encouragement page this morning 
Jeremiah 33, 3, 2 and 3 actually. This is what the Lord says, he who made the earth, the Lord who formed it and established it, the Lord is his name. Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. Next one is... One moment, I have to get into the Old Testament. All right, let's have the New Testament. This is the most important one, Ephesians chapter 2. You can guess which verse it was. What is? This is the most important one. Okay. Right. Really important. For we are God's handiwork. Okay. All that handiwork. Amazing. Even in Stanmore, it's amazing. We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So that's my word to you today. And Lord, we pray that you will prepare us. Lord, you have prepared us up to now. now. And we ask, Lord God, that we will know you're leading And we will walk into those works that you have prepared for us to do. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Rick and Bar. Wow, that was great. You know, I believe God has greater things to do, amen, in this place uh, and through us. And each one of you are important in God's kingdom. Uh, because I believe that each one God will use you for his glory. Hallelujah. Um, uh, today I would like to welcome anyone who has come here for the first time. If you have come here for the first time, you can just raise your hands up. You know, we'd just like to give our new life welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Warm welcome to you. Uh, you will receive a... Uh, a pack, uh, I was going to say gift pack, <laughs> uh, you know, with lots of information in it. Well, that's great. Let's straight uh, go into the Word of God uh, right now. If we can have the slides up, please. You know, really two things I would like to touch on this morning, um, and the first one is on baptism. You know, today, as you can see here, we have a baptism tank filled with water, and uh, today, Ethan, uh, Ethan, if you can just stand up wherever you are, Ethan, (laughs) amen. is going to obey the Lord in water baptism. You know, I had a good chat with him and uh, also went through this Bible study with him. And, you know, he's very determined, you know, to obey the Lord and follow the Lord. So it's really great to see a young man like him, you know, obeying the Lord. The word baptism in Greek means baptizo, which means to immerse. Okay, which means to immerse. It doesn't mean to sprinkle, but it means to immerse. And, you know, we see in the Bible some examples of it. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, Jesus himself, when he was baptized, it says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. Okay, so there was much water. He came up out of the water I don't think he, he went through the baptism of sprinkling. Then we see in Acts 8, 38 to 39, this is about the Ethiopian eunuch. It says, and then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water. Now, if you know, they were on a journey, the Ethiopian eunuch, and God miraculously 
you know, brought Philip into that situation who preached the gospel to Ethiopian eunuch. And I'm sure Ethiopian eunuch must have had a bottle of water for his journey. Um, you know, he could have just said, here I got a bottle of water, you know, baptize me by sprinkling baptism. No. It says, you know, the verse earlier, they looked for much water. And then it says, they went down into the water, they came up out of the water. Then talking about Jesus, you know, I find it very interesting. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 to 17, um, it says, then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you and are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately out of water. So we see here that there was no need for Jesus to be water baptized. He was perfect, he was sinless, he was righteous. But in other words, Jesus was saying, let us not leave any stone unturned. You know, this is to fulfill all righteousness. I just want to do it. I want to do it. What a perfect example. Today, if you have any kind of doubt, you know, about water baptism, you know, let Jesus be the perfect example for you who had no need to be water baptized, you know, but he said, I want to fulfill all righteousness. I want to do it anyway. Amen? Then we see a lot of examples in the Bible. Now, all these people, if you see, they didn't wait long, but they immediately took action to be water baptized. You know, some of it, which I'll read here, in Acts 8, it says, but when they believed Philip as he promised the good news of the kingdom and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then we see in Acts 16, when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited her us to her home. And when it says invited us to her home, that means meals were prepared in those days. That was the culture. And today we are going to celebrate not only the 10 years, but also the water baptism of Ethan by having lunch together. So I would like to invite you all for the lunch. If you have not brought anything, don't worry. Be our guest. We have enough food. Okay? So we see here in the scriptures that people, you know, the moment they accepted the Lord, they said, we want to be baptized. Now, Paul, he mentions, gives an example of what is baptism. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So today, actually, it is a burial service of Ethan. Don't worry. <laughs> so here Paul gives an example that when you are baptized, when you go in water, it's like a burial. You die to your old self and you raise back to the new life in Christ Jesus. Amen? Who should be baptized? Those who accepted his message were baptized, Acts 2.14. So those who received his message, the gospel, the Bible says, they were baptized. Then Acts 8, 12 says, but when they believed Philip, Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. So we see here that they received the message, they believed in the gospel and they got baptized in water. Amen? So, if you have been baptized when you were a child, 
I think we need to ask this question. Did you believe in Lord Jesus Christ at that time? Did you have the capacity to understand and know the gospel? Then in summary of water baptism, first one, water baptism is a demonstration of our obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Two, water baptism is a symbol to identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the scripture we just read. Three, water baptism is a public declaration of our promise not to continue old life. Amen. You are saying to God, Lord, here I come. By obeying the Lord in water baptism, I'm saying to you, I love you and I want to follow you. And then fourth, water baptism is a practical demonstration of a spiritual reality and a personal testimony that we have passed from the old life of sin to the new life in Christ Jesus. And then... Fifth, baptism connects us to the wider body of Christ. By obeying the Lord in water baptism, you're saying, hey church, I now belong to you. I'm part of you. I'm part of the family. You remember last Sunday what I said? We here at New Life Church, we believe we are not a crowd, but a family. Amen? Amen? And when you obey, you become the part of the body of Christ. And also sixth, I wanted to put, but I had no space. You know, you say to Satan, well, he doesn't deserve in my PowerPoint slide to be there. Uh, you know, you say to Satan, I don't belong to you anymore because I belong to Christ. Amen? Amen. By obeying the Lord in water baptism. Now, the second part, which I want to share to all of you this morning is this. You know, we are, I believe that we are living in the last days. We are moving towards it very rapidly. You know, I believe Jesus is coming soon. I don't know when. You know, it might be today, tomorrow, maybe in a year's time, 10 years time, 20 years time. I don't know when he's going to come. But we see the signs around us, the things that are happening around us. It, we are rapidly moving towards it. But we need to ask this question, where do I stand before God? What is my commitment towards God? You know, the thing is, we can live a life, you know, uh, we have this new members lunch and always we talk about that as Christians, we can live a life of like a consumer, you know, and the word, Consumerism, it means the fact or practice of an increasing consumption of goods. You know, where people in this world, they live like consumers, and we have seen the examples when the pandemic happened, you know, that people were panicky and people were buying, you know, loads of toilet paper. I don't know why toilet paper. But people were buying, buying lots of toilet paper. And as if this world has moved to consumerism, and as believers, when we come to God, we can have an attitude of a consumer. Where we ask, Lord, I need this, I need that. Help me. Do this for me or do that for me. You know, we, as I always say this, we pray for three people. I, me, and myself. And we have this consumer attitude even when we come to God. Lord, I need this, I need that. You know, it reminds me of John F. Kennedy, the former president of United States of America. He said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And in the same way, we need to come before God with this attitude, saying to God, Lord, what can I do for you? What can I do for you? You know, Jesus said, 
to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. It says deny yourself, take up his cross and follow me. Because further it says, you know, in the scriptures, that when you do that, you will find life. You will find life. You will find the blessings of God. You will find, you know, a new life in Christ when you deny yourself and take up his cross and follow him. You know, this passage, probably some time back I had shared this. This is the story when Jesus was walking and he came across three people. Now, at this point, Jesus had become very famous. Because if you read the scripture before this passage of scripture, you will see Jesus had fed 5,000 people. He had done many miracles. There were people who were following him. And he was becoming more and more famous. The word was spreading around. And I guess that there were many people who wanted to follow Jesus because he was famous. And many even thought that Jesus can be that person who can stand against the Roman Empire who was ruling over that region and fight against them and be the king. So here is one man. In Luke chapter 9, verse 57 to 58, it says, As they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Now here this man is saying to Jesus, I want to follow you. I'm telling you, if someone tells me, I want to follow you, I want to go wherever you go, I'll be the first person, wow, that's great, come follow me. But Jesus here gives a peculiar answer to him. Instead of saying, I'm glad you're following me, come, follow me. But what does he say? Foxes have dens to live in, and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place even to lay his head. I wonder what that man did at that point because it doesn't say anything about it. I wonder whether he said, in spite of whatever you said, Lord Jesus, I will follow you. Or maybe he could have got a bit discouraged, disheartened, and decided not to follow Jesus. We don't know. But why did Jesus say foxes have dens to live in? He could have said the lions have dens, or he could have given an example of another other animal, but why did he say foxes have den? You know, I did some research and RSPCA, you know, which looks for the welfare of the animals, they say that foxes, you know, though they dig their own holes, but more often they grab other animals' holes. So they are known as grabbers. They want, as I spoke earlier, consumer. I want, I want. So Jesus is trying to say, hey, look, I'm not like the fox. I have given up the glory of heaven. And I have come down to earth to the point where I have nowhere to lay my head. Do you still want to follow me? Then Jesus said, birds are, have nests. Why did Jesus give example of birds? Again, birds, they are very possessive. They are very territorial. They don't want to share the nest with other birds even to the same kinds of birds. You know, they're very possessive about it. In other words, Jesus was saying, I'm not possessive. My heart is the heart of giving to the point that I will lay down my life for you. This is the heart of Jesus. And Jesus is saying, do you still want to follow me? 
Do you want to be like me? Where you are not just a consumer or want to grab, but who is willing to give up. Are you in that place where you're not possessive, but are you willing to sacrifice? Today, the same question we have for every believer to the church. In this world that we live, there is so much of distractions around us. There's so much of demand of our time that consume our time, you know, and more and more it takes us away from God. Today, even Jesus would like to ask you, do you want to follow me to the point where you make me the first priority? The second one, in that same chapter, now here Jesus calls this man. You know, he said to another person, come follow me. The man agreed. It says the man agreed, but he said, Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. So looks like his father must have not died, otherwise he wouldn't have been there listening to the message of Jesus. He would have been home, busy with the funeral. But maybe his father was on deathbed. And he's saying, first go and let me return home and bury my father. You know, you need to understand the Jewish culture. You know, if you read Genesis chapter 48, you know, it speaks about Jacob when he was on his deathbed. Joseph came to him with his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And when you read the full chapter, you will find that because they were close to their father, they received more blessing. You know, at the deathbed. Even so, Manasseh and Ephraim were considered to be the children of Jacob, or he was called Israel. And Manasseh and Jacob, though they were the grandsons of Jacob, they were added into the 12 tribes of Israel. And also they received the blessings. So there was that culture in the Jewish culture that when someone is dying and if their children is close to them, they receive more blessings, more property or whatever it is to the person who is next to the person who is dying. So in Probably this man must have said, first let me go and bury my father. Let me get whatever I can, all the blessings and everything, and then I'll come and follow you. Many times we put these conditions before God, isn't it? You know, Lord, if you do this for me, I will do that for you. But Jesus said, Jesus told him, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach the kingdom of God. What a call. What a challenge. He's saying, don't worry about all those things. You do the things that I tell you to do. How many of us are willing to put ourselves in that place to say to God, Lord, I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to give up all the things that holds back me from you. And the last one, then I'll finish this message. Another said, yes, Lord, I will follow you. Now here, second man saying, Lord Jesus, I'll follow you. But first, let me say goodbye to my family. It was looks genuine, that he wanted to say goodbye before following Jesus. Yeah? You remember when Elijah called Elisha to follow him? And what was Elisha doing? He was in the field plowing the ground. Elijah comes, puts his mantle on him, and says, follow me. And he says, let me go and say bid goodbye to my parents. 
And Elijah rebukes him and says, what have I done to you? But Elisha, then he decides to follow Elijah. And Elisha becomes the great prophet. In fact, he receives the double portion of the anointing. Now here, Jesus encounters this man and he says, let me go and say goodbye to my family. But what did Jesus say to him? Jesus told him, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and looks back, then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. You know, Jesus gave this example of a man with a plow, plowing the ground. And the reason he said that, because if a man, he keeps looking back while he's plowing, he will miss the straight line and he can go crooked ways. He will miss the destiny where he needs to go. God has a destiny for you. And God is calling you to walk in that plan and purpose and the destiny that he has for you. There might be many distractions that come where you have the temptation of keep looking back or keep looking here and there to your left and right. But what Jesus is saying, let your focus be on me. Follow me. You know, this is a perfect example of this story because I have seen this happening, you know, to my, one of my far distance relative who had come to know the Lord. He comes from a Hindu background and he came to know the Lord and he was going to church, but then he decided to go back to his native place and tell his parents, you know, that he's following Jesus. And when he went there, he was brainwashed and then he changed his mind and he decided not to follow Jesus. So probably Jesus knew about this man. He might have known that if this man goes back home and tells his parents that he want to follow Jesus, he might not come back. And that's why I said, if anyone puts his hand on the plow and looks back, he's not fit in my kingdom. People of God, in closing, I would like to say this to you. As I said earlier, we are living in the last days, challenging time. More and more stuffs are happening around us. More and more challenging times we are living in. More and more chaos is there in this world. Do you hear the voice of God? Do you hear the call of God that is calling you? Saying to you, my child, come to me. My child, follow me. Don't be distracted by the things that goes around you. But let your focus be on me. Follow me. Amen? And I'm telling you this. That when you make Jesus your priority, you make Jesus first in your life, you know, you will see fruitfulness in your life. You will see how God uses you for his glory. Amen? As I said, each one of you here in this place are called by God. You have a destiny. Let's walk in the destiny that God has for us. Hallelujah. Amen. So, Father, I pray right now. Lord, even as we are going to the next stage of this service with the water baptism, I pray for your presence and blessing over this place, over every one of us. Father, I pray the message that has come will bring life to people. Lord, we pray that you'd help us by the power of your Holy Spirit to bring us to a place where we are not clouded, where we are not clouded by the things that goes on in life, but Lord, help us to see Jesus. Help us to see you, Lord, and give us the courage to follow you no matter what. Pray for your blessing, Lord, in Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. Just want to say this. I do this every baptism service. Though Ethan is going to be water baptized today, but if God is speaking to you this morning and you're not water baptized, you have not obeyed the Lord in water baptism according to the teaching which I gave. This is your moment. Take that bold step. Come forward and speak to us during this service and we'll be happy to water baptize you. You know, we have extra pairs of clothes if you need and towels. So don't worry about that. You know, if God speaks to you, don't delay, but obey him. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So we'll worship God with a song. Amen. I would like to call Ethan to come and share his testimony or a few words he would like to say. Ever since I can remember, I wanted to be baptized, so, so I'm quite happy to be doing it now. Thank you, Silas, for bringing it up to my mum, and thank you, God, for being in my life. Amen. Yeah, that's great. Ethan, I would like to ask you this question. Have you accepted and received Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? Yes. Amen. So. So, Ethan, according to the confession of your faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus Christ's name. Father, we thank you for Ethan. We thank you, Lord, that your smile is upon him right now. I pray that he will know that he's loved by you and that your promises are true. They are yes and amen. And he will know that you will never leave him or forsake him. I pray that he will know that you have a mighty plan for his life. And sometimes, Lord, when, you're, when we're marked for you, when we've been called by you, it can be a scary thing. But, Lord, we know that you, for those that you call, for those that you give an assignment to, Lord, you always give provision. 
And I pray for Ethan that he will rest that knowing that everything, every one of his needs will be provided. That if he's wondering whether to go left or right or forward, you will direct his steps in, as you say in your scriptures. And that he has no need to fear, but just to rest in you and to just keep moving forward step by step with you. And we pray the Holy Spirit will just come and fill him, fill his life, give him understanding, direction, and, and just as un, un, unspeakable joy, we pray. I pray that the light, Lord, that same smile that, you, that you, we perceive you have on him right now, I pray that it will be a light that goes wherever he walks, people will see that same light, the smile of God upon the favor of God on him. I pray that it will open doors, that it will encourage people, that he will be a living testimony to other people. And we'll look back at a day like this and say, wow, look what the Lord has done. We never thought this, but wow. And so, Lord, I pray, Lord, you'll give Ethan the strength to run his, way, run his race, even as a young age, run his race and run it well for your glory and, and for the, the, the word of that your kingdom can be expanded and, and we just see your glory just go further and further and further. So thank you for Ethan. Thank you for his life. And we bless him now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. It's a, a few verses in 2 Timothy and chapter 2. So you'll remember that, I'm sure. I'm not going to read it all, but the very beginning it says, Live your life empowered by God's grace. That's very important. And toward the end, in verse uh, 6, it says, Make Jesus the anointed one your focus in life and in ministry. God, I believe, has got a work for you. I'm going to give you a Bible that you can take, and it will help you. Every day there are readings, and there are things that you can find out in the Word of God, and this is something you can treasure and use throughout your life. Wear it out. <laughs> I've worn several Bibles away, so wear it out, okay? Amen. Ethan, I believe this word is for you as well. Being a young lad and you've got lots of ways in your life to learn from God, but this is what he's promising you today. He says, for I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Thoughts and plans for welfare and peace and not for evil, to give you hope in your final outcome. got a verse for you from Joshua. And Moses had just died and Joshua was given the task of leading the people of Israel. And from his perspective, it would be such a huge and daunting task, but God was with him and God gave him this, these words. He said, be strong and courageous. Now, if you try and do things in your own strength, it's going to be hard. You'll fail. It'll be really difficult. Keep your eyes on God and you will be able to succeed, and you will be strong, and you will be courageous. Do not be afraid. Things around him would have been pretty scary. He had so much responsibility on him, but he kept his eyes on the Lord, who is so much bigger than anything else around him. So keep your eyes on the Lord, and you will not be fearful. You will be able to be strong. And then do not be discouraged. There are going to be times in your life when you're doing what God has asked you to do and it's going to look hopeless and you're going to think, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Keep your eyes on what God has told you to do. Remember that. Keep faith and trust in him that he's directing your path and you are going to succeed. So the whole verse is this, and this is when God has given you your calling, what he wants you to do, this is what you need to keep to heart. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Uh, Ethan, it's uh, great to see young 
people loving the Lord. Yes. And uh, there's a lot of people that want to love the Lord, but they are not free because they are being uh, trapped by either the things that they like that they cannot depart from or they are trapped uh, there's a pastor who says uh, freed by the Lord but uh, imprisoned by culture so you are free because you accepted the Lord and uh, I just want to give you this scripture. It's a long scripture. Second Kings chapter 22 says, Josiah ruled in Judah. Josiah was eight years old when he became king. Uh, the message is not about becoming the king. It's the change that he ministered when he became king. And uh, the father before did what was wrong. The brother before did what was wrong. But when he took over, he, took, he, he did what was right in the, in the presence of the Lord. He made the change in, in the community. And he was eight years old. He was not old. As he grew, he, grew in, he grew in the Lord and made the change. He decided to, to do what was right in the sight of the Lord in the instruction and encouragement of the mother. So, stays in the Lord, listen to what the mother says, and keep praying with the mother, and then the Lord will be with you. Thank you.